Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Trine University and welcome to the beautiful T First, Tooth T First Center for Performing Arts and the Ryan Concert Hall for our 9-11 memorial event. We thank all of you for being here this morning for the first session of our school year's Distinguished Speaker Series. And we're certainly greatly honored this morning to have a very accomplished individual with us in General Omar Cliff Tooley Jr., who I'll introduce in a few minutes, but good morning and welcome to you, General Tooley. A pleasure and honor to have you on our campus this morning. 20 years. It's been two complete decades, 7,304 days since the terrorist attack of September 11th, 2001. 20 years have passed since the event that would devastate a nation and would change the course of history forever. Even in the midst of unparalleled destruction and violence, the days and months after 9-11 showed an incredible resilience, courage, and strength of the American people. And it's in this spirit that we join here together today. For those of us old enough to experience that day and remember, we know that September 11, 2001 forever changed our world. For those including most of our current students, this anniversary serves as both a critical history lesson and a critical opportunity to honor the dignity and strength of all of those directly impacted by the tragic events that unfolded that day. On that fateful day, thousands of unsuspecting and innocent men, women, and children were attacked along with our way of life, one of freedom and democracy. And it's fitting that we join together today to remain committed to informing our young people about that impactful day and to honor the memory of those lost along with their families, friends, and a nation that still grieves their loss. At this time, I ask that you please stand. The Trine University Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps, joined by cadets from Notre Dame's ROTC, will present the colors, followed by the singing of the national anthem by the Trine University Choir.
Also at this time, would you please join me in a moment of silence to honor the victims of September 11, 2001. The civilians killed in the attack, those that gave their lives saving others, their families and loved ones, survivors, first responders, and members of their armed for forces who have died and those that continue to wage the war on terrorism. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> At this time, I would ask that all of our veterans and those active members of our armed services with us here today, please stand and be recognized, as well as local emergency and first responders here with us today. Will you all please stand and we honor and salute you for your sacrifices, your courage and service to our country. Would you all please stand? Thank you. At this time, it's my honor to introduce and welcome our distinguished speaker, Major General Omer C. Cliff Tooley, Jr., who served more than a 40-year career in the U.S. Army and today serves as President of Defense Development for the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. Appointed by Governor Eric Holcomb to his current role in 2019, General Tooley is responsible for growing Indiana's defense industry by promoting the state's defense assets, assisting in business development, and attracting and supporting defense-related industry partnerships activities under the direction of the Indiana Secretary of Commerce, Brad Chambers. General Tooley previously served as president of Ludus Servium, a defense industry-focused consulting group he found in 2018 and Chief Executive Officer and Board Chairman of the Indiana Defense Network. Prior to joining the private sector in 2016, General Tooley served as Assistant Adjunct General, Army of the Indiana National Guard, where he is responsible for the development of the Atterbury Makatatuck Center for Complex Operations. He currently serves on the Board of Directors of the National Defense Industrial Association. During his 41 years of military service, General Tooley served in staff and leadership roles during peacetime, combat, and domestic emergency situations, including tours of the 101st Airborne Division, the 82nd Airborne Division, 10th Mountain Division, 38th Infantry Division, Institute for Military Assistance, and the Indiana National Guard. He has received more than 30 honors and decorations throughout his military career, including the Legion of Merit, which he is a three-time recipient, as well as the Distinguished Service Medal. General Tooley has also received the Sagamore of the Wabash, the Public Service Achievement, and Distinguished Hoosier Awards from the State of Indiana. General Tooley holds a Bachelor of Arts in Social Studies from Western Kentucky University and a Master of Science in Adult and Continuing Education from the University of Southern California. He and his wife Connie have three sons and eight grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in giving a warm Trine University welcome to General Cliff Tooley. General Tooley. Well, it's truly an honor and privilege for me to be here today, and, and also a, a great surprise that I have good friends here from uh, my military past that, uh, that uh, have uh, honored me with their presence today. But, uh, but Dr. Brooks, distinguished guests, faculty, students, and friends of Trine University, I do thank you for inviting me here today to join with you in this remembrance of the tragic event that took place 20 years ago tomorrow, when 19 suicide bombers turned four commercial airliners into weapons of mass destruction 
executed a highly symbolic terrorist attack on American soil, killing 2,977 people, injuring 6,000, and inflicting over $2 trillion in economic damage. Like no other, this, no other event, this event burned into our national psyche the number 911, but not in the way intended by the perpetrators of that day's horrific attacks. I would like to spend our time together sharing some thoughts on that reality in the context of the discipline referred to as national or international security and their first cousin, national power, as understood and practiced within the community I grew up in, the military. In my world, a metaphorical tool often employed to describe these concepts associated with those concepts associated with national security and national power is the Parthenon, the mid fifth century temple sitting on the Acropolis in Athens. Now, having been constructed during the same period that saw the birth of democracy, the Parthenon, as this group of folks well know, has become an internationally recognized symbol of the ideal of rule by the people. Architecturally, the Parthenon has three basic components. A three-step base on which sets a colonnade supporting a roof structure whose east and west ends consist of a low triangular pediment. The collective effect of, uh, of is the creation of a unique, instantly recognizable facade. Within the military's national security strategy community, that facade is used as a metaphorical representation of the components of national security and national power and their relationship to each other. The triangular pediment on top represents the totality of national security, one definition of which is the preservation of the norms, rules, institutions, and values of society. In the military model, the pediments rest on top of seven columns representing the elements of national power, diplomatic, information, military, economic, financial, intelligence, and law enforcement. The columns in turn rest on a three-step base representing the foundation of national power and ultimately national security. The top level being a nation's economy, the middle being its culture, demographics, societal organization, and geography. And at the very base, the foundation, that which stabilizes and grounds the structure are the values and virtues that define the nation as a people. The idea is that a nation's security is derived from the power generated by the strength of its economy, that is, an outgrowth of the characteristics of the society and the geographic advantages or disadvantages of it, its location on the face of the planet. But most importantly, it is derived from the shared values and virtues of its people. I began my comments by describing the attack on 911 as highly symbolic for it was deliberately designed uh, to be so by its perpetrators. A powerful emotional statement of hatred and contempt directed towards the Western world in general and the United States in particular. The Al-Qaeda leadership at the time, Osama bin Laden, his chief of operations, Mohammed Atif, and his deputy and heir, Ayman Sawari, were schooled in the art of military strategy and its design framework referred to as ends, ways, and means. As described in the 9-11 Commission report, the Al-Qaeda leadership based their strategy on symbols of Islam's past greatness, promises to restore pride to people who considered themselves victims of successive foreign masters, liberal use of cultural and religious allusions to the Holy Quran and some of its interpreters, and appeals to people disoriented by cyclonic changes as they've confronted modernity, modernity and globalization. The Al-Qaeda strategic end was to undermine the contemporary world order of nation states and recreate, recreate the historical Ummah, the worldwide community of Muslims once held together by a common political authority. They focused, on, they, they focused on the ways on singling out the United States as being the enemy, stressing grievances against the U.S. while they shared at the time in the Muslim world. An enemy that jihadists worldwide could easily identify with and rally against. The means they chose to launch their strategic plan was a dramatic, violent attack upon three sites that symbolized the essence of U.S. national power. The Twin Tires, economic, the Pentagon, military, and the Capitol building, 
political. They established the timing of the attack to achieve maximum psychological and information impact in broad daylight, beginning of the work day, so that the attack in the immediate aftermath would play out in full view of the world, with high potential for national and international media coverage to magnify its global psychological and informational impact. Except for the failure to hit the Capitol building due to the extraordinary bravery of the 40 passengers and crew of United Airlines Flight 93 that brought that plane down in a Pennsylvania field, they effectively achieved their tactical objective. That day led to more days of terror as 9-11's ripple effect saw the spread of terrorist activities to over 80 other countries. And over the course of the last 20 years, taking an additional 900,000 lives and an additional $8 trillion in economic loss globally as uh, determined by a recent Brown University study. Not included in those numbers are the societal costs to our nation and the world that have yet to be calculated. And yet, despite the onerous deaths, pain, and suffering inflicted by 9-11 and its aftermath, Al-Qaeda and its evil cousins failed to achieve their strategic end. For today, you and I gather here today as free people, living in a country that, in spite of all of its flaws, remains the light, hope, and envy of the world. Now, how is that so? The answer to that, I believe, lies in the foundation, the values and virtues that define us as a people and a nation. Al-Qaeda damaged the pillars, but did not affect the foundation. Much has been written about those values and virtues, and I will not attempt to enumerate or summarize them here today, other than to say that each of us in our heart of hearts intrinsically know what they are, because they are what unite and define us as a people. I find it most remarkable and inspiring when a nation of 300 million plus instinctively moves collectively as one in the direction of what is right and good and noble and heroic when confronted with a crisis such as 911. Now, one of my favorite books is titled Freedom in the Making of Western Culture, written by Orlando Patterson, a historical and cultural sociologist at Harvard University. The central thesis to his book is that freedom is not the natural state of mankind but the result of forces that have played out over centuries, and as the title suggests, in the Western world. He points out that even today, freedom is not a condition experienced by most people in the world. He goes on to describe how much of the world conflates freedom with license and explores the ramifications of that on cultures, worldviews, and behaviors. I commend the book to you for some not so light, late bedtime reading. Now, I mention this book and its thesis because for me, 9-11 was not just a tragic, infamous event occurring at a moment in time, but also a mile marker on our journey as a free people, a point at which we were reminded that freedom is a blessing uniquely gifted to us, a blessing not to be taken for granted. That freedom is something we are called upon to share with the world but with the full realization that it is not necessarily something understood or valued by a significant portion of that world. It is a reminder that the cost of freedom is steep, paid for with the lives of 2,977 of our fellow freedom sojourners on 9-11, thousands in the 20 years since, and most recently by 13 young service members defending the gate at the Kabul airport as they were evacuating Afghan refugees. It is also a reminder that there is no greater purpose or mission in our society today than that is, that is entrusted to institutions such as Tryon University, charged with the mission of preparing the next generation of leaders. Those that are sitting in this office will be soon picking up the reins, the mantle, if you will, of leadership uh, in this free world. Now, it's, the task is, is to equip everyone with the skills they require to exercise the elements of national power wisely and judicially when they assume the mantle of leadership, but more importantly, helping them to understand and incorporate into their core being the values and virtues that define us as a people and them as a person. i be uniquely blessed by this gift we call freedom, for these values and virtues will serve as your compass in navigating the complex and fearful storms 
that you and our nation will certainly face in the future. It was told to me once, focus on the base and the rest will fall in place. I would like to thank all of you for what you have done and continue to do to make our nation the light and beacon of the world. Most importantly, in fulfilling the high calling of shaping our nation's future leaders. May God continue to bless you in your efforts. I also ask God to continue to bless America, its people, and the families and loved ones of those who have given their lives in defense of all that we love and cherish. And in recognition of what we gather here today to remember, I ask his special blessings on the families, friends, and loved ones of our 2,977 brothers and sisters who laid their lives down 20 years ago so that we might be able to gather here today as free people. Thank you. So we're going to put General Tooley on the spot here for a minute and ask uh, if he would take a few few questions from the audience. Does anyone have any questions this morning? We've got two microphones down each aisle way here. So would any of you uh, this morning have a question or two for the general? General, uh, first, thank you for your service and all that you've done for, for all of us here and in, in, in our country. Um, would you mind sharing with with the group where you were and, and how where you were on the 9/11 on when when the attacks happened? Uh, uh, on, on when 9/11 happened, uh, my position at that time was chief of staff of the Indiana National Guard, and we were and I can't remember Todd if you were there in that when, when we were doing that. I think you were, uh, but we were having our normal morning staff update brief where we we're going through the the typical stuff, and then in came someone said. Yeah, you got to see what's on TV type of thing. And so we watched, you know, the tires and being hit and all this stuff. And, uh, and we knew at that point in time in space that our world uh, had changed and uh, that, that we were at war. And, uh, and so, uh, so, yes, I think, and, uh, and I recognize that, that most folks in here uh, were, uh, were, were not there at that time, alive at that time to see that event. Uh, but for 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 us, it it had the same impact, uh, at least for me. You know, I'm I'm an I'm an older guy, and so if you go back through history, we us older folks remember things like the Kennedy assassination, and uh, you know, and, and things like that. Uh, but this is uh, but this is one of those that was a clear signal that uh, that our world had changed. So you know, thank you for asking that. But um, any others? General, again, thank you for your service. Um, do you have an opinion with regard to the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, and is this not destined to repeat itself all over again? Wow, this, uh, this, is this non-attributable in here? So, <laughs> uh, Well, <clears throat> you know, the, the one thing, you know, having spent 40 years in the military and a significant part about it in senior leadership positions, <clears throat> the first thing I do, uh, I have caution myself, is don't second guess, second guess the ones that are in the saddle. Because uh, I don't have at my fingertips everything. It was the information, the decisions, the discussions, and all that went on uh, inside of the various rooms that led to the extraction. And uh, so, so I, in terms of, of chaos, and I think that for those who have worn a uniform, realize that that in the world of the military, that uh, that in most situations we get into, uh, have all the characteristics of chaos, and it's the responsibility of the military to try to bring some sort of order and and sanity to the chaos. And uh, and then uh, so I won't, I, you know, I don't want to get into the political side of the house because everything gets weaponized in that community and, and this type of stuff. Uh, so, uh, and, and again, I don't want to second guess the leaders because I do not know what the, that, that they knew. Uh, but I can rest pretty sure, uh, well assured, and I think that you can too, that uh, the young men and women 
uh, and, uh, and the leaders that they had over them at that time were, were, at, were doing their job uh, faithfully and, uh, and with great wisdom and under very trying circumstances. And, uh, and so, uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. You know, it's the unfortunate thing is, is, that, is, is that as I understand it, you know, you had, a, you, you had the, a terrorist group insert themselves into the midst of that to take advantage of it which led to the suicide bomb that killed the 13. And, uh, but, uh, but those things, you know, those are the types of things that happens in, in chaotic parts of the world like that. Uh, hopefully I danced around that well enough. <laughs> but throw some others at me. Can I give you one more speculative question? Yes, sir. It'll be 80 years this December that we began an involvement in a conflict that um, my family was very close to. It appears to be, in my opinion, destined to repeat itself again. Is anybody, I've asked this question of two congressmen, and when they got done, I'm not sure what they said. So <laughs> I, I, someone that may have been closer to this the growth and proliferation of the diesel-electric submarine capacity and capability of the Chinese in the South China Sea. And that's what got us into, or what precipitated the attacks in Hawaii. Are we not going there again? Is anybody paying attention to the Chinese and the growth of their military and their navy and what the <coughs> potential restrictions it'll cause in the economy and the world if they gain, garnish control? I can't seem to get an answer. Well, Very absolutely. concerned of it. Well, that's a great question, and uh, and actually, I'm indirectly involved in that from from the business side of the house. But 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 just you know, to give you the cliff notes on military history uh, type of thing, I recognize that attention, you know, and interest has the uh, shelf life of a fruit fly. So I don't want to expand it beyond what you're uh, you're uh, you are capable of enduring, but. But inside of the, if you look historically, uh, the, the defense world operates, conflict operates in about a 30 year, what we call a secular cycle. About every 30 years from the, from the pit to the top. You hear about business cycles and all this type of stuff. And so, so you go back 30 years ago, uh, in uh, 1991, uh, ended the, the last phase of what we called great power competition. That was with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we, we, built, we built a capability uh, in armed forces, a whole approach to business to deal with a peer threat, in this case, the Soviet Union. Uh, in 1991, the wheels fell off of the Soviet Union, and we entered a period of uh, what they uh, refer to as a period of atrophy uh, in which we had a series of conflicts that co collectively uh, came to be referred to as a global war on terror. Uh, during that... 30-year period, we did not have a peer uh, competitor in the world. And, uh, and so we were uh, focused on terrorism and counterterrorism and so on. Now I'll tell you, just uh, this is the deal that, there's, that you ask about China. Uh, the struggle is, is that while we were focused on all of these conflicts around the world, China was rebuilding itself. And uh, it, uh, it went to great effort. It, it created, a, it created a, its, its grand strategy, the one belt, one road uh, concept, uh, directed towards reestablishing itself as the, uh, what they believe is the rightful power, global power. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they rebuilt their, uh, their defense industry. Uh, they modernized it. Uh, and, uh, and, and in that time frame, as we were, we were moving to globalization and this type of stuff. We, we uh, unconsciously, I guess, uh, uh, actually offshored 70% of our defense industry overseas. With 10 to 15% of that of critical industries sole sourced in China. And then so as, as we watched the rise of China and, uh, and they started playing out their strategy over the last 10 years really, even as we were offshoring theirs, they were inshoring uh, reshoring and building uh, their capacity and building the capacity of their their military in particular uh, but also exercising all the other elements of political power so as you've pointed out their navy is now larger than our navy 
and uh, their army has always been larger than our army, uh, and their air force is, uh, is gaining parity. They have uh, exceeded our capabilities in, in high technology systems like uh, hypersonic weapons and also uh, uh, counter as anti-satellite systems and so on. And, uh, and, and then they're very aggressively in the world of cyber. We've watched all this grow. Now within the military, within the national security structure, they are refocusing from this period of strategic period of atrophy to a period of what we're referring to as near peer competition. And so in that world, there's two, there's, there's there, the focus on the national strategy and rearm, uh, focus on the, uh, on the realigning of it is on China as the primary threat, Russia as a near peer competitor, and then two others, wild cards, Iran and North Korea. And, uh, and so there's, there's this whole focus in terms of realigning uh, the armed uh, forces uh, in terms of the, their, their, uh, their tactics, their strategy, their equipment, their organization, and so on. We're going through a period of robust uh, technology development uh, to, to, to bring back our edge, if you will, in, in those type of things. And, and more importantly, what you're watching too is, is a, 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 an effort to realign our strategic alliances so that uh, we can counter uh, their global push. And uh, so yes, uh, the answer is we, uh, we clearly represent, it's, in our, it's stated in our national security strategy, China is the concern uh, along with Russia. Uh, and then to a lesser degree, Iran and, uh, and uh, North Korea. And we are realigning our forces as we can uh, to that threat. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, sir. Good morning, General. Thanks for sir. being here and thanks for your service. I just wanted to relate something to you and also ask your guidance and, and words to the students that are here. Uh, <clears throat> my uncle, who recently passed away, was a member of the United States Navy for many years, and he served with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Com Fibron 8, during 1976, and he taught at the Naval War College uh, as other places as well. And I remember asking him when I was these people's age, <clears throat> what was his secret to success and what to look forward to in the worlds ahead, and he said, it's real simple, Jim, taking on responsibility at a young age and I would like you, if you could, maybe to dig into that a little bit and maybe give some advice to our young people here today. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a, that's a great observation and a, and, and a great uh, direction to go into. Uh, you know, I go back to, uh, you, you think of, you know, at any given point in time and space, there are young people and there are old people, right? And the way history works is you too will be old someday, all right? <laughs> And, uh, and so, so you're going to you're going to you're going to walk you're going to go that journey you know through uh, through your life, and uh, and you know and I always harken back to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, a, a quote from the Good Book that basically says there is nothing new under the sun, and uh, and, and and it is so true because uh, with all of our great intentions and all of our great hopes and high hopes, which we should maintain and strive for, don't don't dismiss that. You know that that's what separates us from the animal kingdom. You know, and so, but keeping that, there's also that reality is that that we are populated, the world is populated with humans, and uh, and so there's going to be there's going to be wars and rumors of war. There's going to be strife. There's going to be all of this other type of stuff. And, uh, and, and, and if we're to survive as a nation, as a people, it's going to be, it's incumbent upon you. The folks are sitting in this room today. And how will you prepare yourself for that? You will be the leaders in the diplomatic realm, in the political realm, in the military realm, and all of those other pillars that I talked about out there. You're all striving for different uh, areas of expertise, all of which are critical to our collective success and our collective power, national power and collective security. And, uh, but what will bind you together is those core values that you have. 
And, uh, and so I say that as you're walking your journey, don't neglect those uh, uh, as you go along. Because uh, when, when, when challenges come, when the hard times come, when the storms come, that's what will get you through. That will provide you the direction and, and the, the compass, if you will, that will get you through there. Because I can guarantee you that when you're confronted with these type of situations out there in the world, these complex environment situations, you will not be able to pull a pat answer out of your pocket and whoop it out. Uh, it will require your experience, your judgment, the training that you've imposed upon yourself and all of that. And, uh, and so each generation is confronted with that. Uh, as a young man, I grew up at the, uh, at the feet of uh, uh, my dad and, and three uncles who all fought in World War II. And, uh, and went through uh, the, uh, the Spanish flu uh, losing people in, in that crisis, followed by the Depression, followed by World War II. And I listened, you know, and, 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 and tried to learn from their footsteps. Now, one of the things that they kept telling me was they tell all these stories and stuff, and they said, hey, don't go in the military. And uh, so I said, all right, that's number one thing I'm going to do is go in the military, you know. So, but anyway, I listened at the footstep, and then I experienced that as we walked along, you know, the path, uh, my journey. You two are now entering, you know, your journey. And, uh, and we, you know, you, you pray for the best. You know, our, they talk about liberalism and they talk about re, uh, realism in terms of the approach to the universe. Uh, you want to never forget the liberalism. That means by the, looking for the best of humankind. But you also have to be prepared for the worst of humankind. And uh, so anyway, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but, but, uh, but I do envy you because, uh, you know, if, I've already blown every chance I've had as I got along here. Now you guys got all that ahead of you, and you know, so you got you got all these lessons to learn and, and great things to experience. Any other thing? Okay. Well, you know, I, I, I'm going to give up the mic, but I just want to take this last opportunity to tell you that that uh, I, you are our nation's treasure. And in you uh, is what folks like me want to invest in because you are our future and you are the hope of the future. And, uh, and so, so never take lightly uh, what you bring to the table. Uh, never discount it. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you right now that uh, if, you, if, you, if, if you continue on the path you're doing, you're going to experience great success and our, and our nation will rest in great hands. So thank you again for the opportunity. General Taylor, we thank you for being here with us this morning. We thank you for your service to, uh, to our country. We have a small token of appreciation we want to share with you for being with us this morning and opening our distinguished speaker series. I ask you to step to this side. Will you all please join me again in, in thanking General Taylor. And I want to thank all of you again for being here this morning. Now at this time, we'll, we'll close the program. Will you please stand and join me uh, this morning as the Trine University concludes this morning's event with the singing of God Bless America. Thank you again for coming this morning.